We're now going to continue our study of electrophilic additions to alkenes, studying three reactions that are really going to give us a deeper appreciation for this reaction type. In hydroboration oxidation, we find our first bona fide anti-Markovnikov addition reaction. The trick to hydroboration is that it uses an interesting reagent containing BH bonds that have the opposite polarity that we're used to for hydrogen. In oxymercuration, we'll find a Markovnikov addition method, a method for Markovnikov type hydration that avoids a discrete carbocation intermediate, eliminating the possibility of carbocation rearrangements, which can be a problem in acid catalyzed methods. And we're going to look at epoxidation, which uses an electrophilic source of oxygen reminiscent of the halogenation process. Epoxidation plops an oxygen down on top of an alkene ending at the three-membered ring stage where hal halogenation continued with capture of the halonium ion by a nucleophile. In epoxidation, we simply pop that oxygen on and we can take that epoxide on to do all kinds of other chemistry like nucleophilic substitution. In acid-catalyzed hydration, we've seen a reaction that adds water across the atoms of a carbon-carbon pi bond in a Markovnikov type fashion, meaning that the nucleophilic portion here the OH group, adds to the more substituted carbon where a carbocation forms in the course of a mechanism. But what if we wanted to reverse the site selectivity of this process? How could we obtain a product in which OH adds to the less substituted carbon and hydrogen to the more substituted carbon? Well, this is going to require a creative take on electrophilic addition, since we can't just use acid and water anymore. That would lead to Markovnikov selectivity. What we really need to do in order to achieve anti-Markovnikov addition of hydrogen and OH is somehow turn the hydrogen into a nucleophile. If you think back to acid-catalyzed hydration, the acid part of acid-catalyzed hydration implies that hydrogen is an electrophile. It's essentially H+. But to achieve this opposite site selectivity, we somehow need to transform hydrogen from an electrophile, as it is in something like HCl or H2SO4, into a nucleophile. In addition, and this is in some ways even trippier than turning hydrogen into a nucleophile, we somehow need to turn oxygen into an electrophile. How on earth do we do this? Well, the two stages of hydroboration oxidation are actually designed to achieve these effects. In the hydroboration stage, we supply the alkene with a nucleophilic source of hydrogen, and we'll talk about what that means in the remainder of this video. In the oxidation stage, we supply the intermediate following hydroboration with an electrophilic source of oxygen, and again, we'll talk about the specifics of this in the remainder of this video. The net result is anti-Markovnikov hydration, addition of H and OH with opposite site selectivity to that predicted by Markovnikov's rule. How can we begin to think about achieving the opposite site selectivity of Markovnikov's rule? Well, to begin, let's look at something that adds to an alkene in a Markovnikov type fashion, HCl. If we think about the electron density map for HCl, due to the strong electronegativity of chlorine, we find that the hydrogen atom in this molecule is significantly partially positive. To put a number on it, based on a quantum chemical calculation, it's something like plus 0.24 in partial charge. When HCl reacts with an alkene, it prefers to do so in such a way that the partially positive hydrogen atom forms a bond to the terminal carbon of the alkene. This ensures that partial positive charge in the transition state and eventually full positive charge in the carbocation intermediate that follows will be located on the more stable position, the more substituted position. For an analogous reason, the chlorine, which is partially negative in HCl, forms a bond to the more substituted position. The general point here is that the more substituted position would prefer to form a bond to the partially negative atom in the reagent. In essence, the polarity of the alkene is opposite that of the reagent. The partially positive carbon of the alkene is attracted to the partially negative carbon in the reagent, and the partially negative carbon in the alkene is attracted to the partially positive atom in the reagent. This is simply opposite charges attract in action. What if we wanted to reverse the partial charges? Well, we'd have to link hydrogen to something that's less electronegative than hydrogen is. Boron appears to be a great candidate. Boron is electropositive. It's less electronegative than hydrogen is. This means that the polarity of boranes is opposite that of HCl. 
Boranes contain a boron-hydrogen bond as well as two other hydrogens or two carbon groups. And looking at an electrostatic potential map, we can see a stark difference between the hydrogens and the molecules shown here, BH3, and the hydrogen in HCl. The hydrogens in BH3 are very clearly partially negatively charged, and a quantum chemical calculation shows that these have partial negative charges as something like negative 0.04. That's not much, but it is enough to bias this reagent to add to an alkene in the opposite direction. Because the hydrogen in the BH bond is partially negative, and the boron in this bond is partially positive, the hydrogen ends up linked to the more substituted position. Notice that the same general principle is still applying here. The partially negative atom in the reagent is still attracted to the partially positive atom in the alkene, and the partially positive atom in the reagent is still attracted to the partially negative atom in the alkene. We've managed to alter the site selectivity by supplying the alkene with a nucleophilic source of hydrogen in the borane, as opposed to an electrophilic source of hydrogen, which we've seen in hydrohalogenation and acid-catalyzed hydration reactions already in the past. Hydration in particular is the addition of H and OH, and so if our goal is to achieve anti-Markovnikov hydration, we need to be able to convert the boron group into an OH group, and that's actually the goal of the second stage, which we'll talk about here in a second. But first, let's look at the hydroboration process in detail. The mechanism of the first stage of this reaction involves syn addition of the boron reagent to the alkene. The hydrogen and boron add simultaneously through an elementary step that resembles both electrophilic addition of boron to the alkene and nucleophilic addition of the BH bond to the alkene. This elementary step occurs in a syn-type fashion, meaning the hydrogen and the BH2 group end up on the same side of the plane formed by the original alkene. Although this particular example doesn't set two stereocenters, I've drawn both the H and the BH2 group on wedges to emphasize that this is a syn addition. Notice the site selectivity as well. This is an anti-Markovnikov addition. Hydrogen is adding to the more substituted carbon here, and the boron group is adding to the less substituted carbon. If only we could transform that BH2 group into an OH group, we'll have achieved our goal of anti-Markovnikov hydration. That's the goal of the second stage. In the second stage of this mechanism, the BR2 group, here we've replaced H with R, recognizing that the other two BH bonds can also engage in hydroboration, is replaced with a hydroxyl group. And this is done by supplying this reagent, which actually contains a mildly nucleophilic carbon right here with an electrophilic source of oxygen. And this is done by treatment with sodium hydroxide, a strong base, and hydrogen peroxide. To understand how these conditions supply an electrophilic source of oxygen, it's worth meditating on the molecule hydrogen peroxide just a little bit. Although in general, hydroxide is a poor leaving group, we can imagine under the right circumstances that it could depart with a pair of electrons, forming OH-. This is actually somewhat analogous to the situation we saw for the elemental halogens in electrophilic halogenation previously, where one of the two atoms in, say, Br2 could take with it a pair of electrons, leaving the other atom electrophilic. A similar thing can happen in hydrogen peroxide, meaning that this oxygen, the one that does not depart with a pair of electrons, is somewhat electrophilic. The purpose of sodium hydroxide under these reaction conditions is to deprotonate hydrogen peroxide, forming a peroxide anion. This is actually a heavily favored acid-base process for reasons that I'll let you meditate on. This deprotonation step forms a species in which oxygen has a negative charge and is connected to an OH group, and that's going to become important in a second. Association of the anionic nucleophilic oxygen in this O2H- species to boron through an A sub N elementary step forms an intermediate in which the boron is negatively charged. Migration of this carbon-bromine bond to oxygen, which is an example of a 1-2 rearrangement step then occurs. And at the same time, hydroxide departs with a pair of electrons. This ensures that the octet rule is obeyed at this oxygen, and it transfers negative charge from boron to oxygen, which is generally going to be favorable due to the greater electronegativity of oxygen. From the perspective of this central oxygen atom, this looks like an SN2 substitution reaction with a leaving group departing from the oxygen and a nucleophile coming in. And notice that this is the step that establishes the key carbon-oxygen bond in the product. If this carbon that's attached to boron is a stereocenter, then we have to worry about the stereochemistry of this step. Thankfully, it's relatively simple, as this step occurs with retention 
of configuration. This means that the syn addition of hydrogen and Br2 observed in the hydroboration phase is carried through the oxidation phase. And all that we have to do now is replace the Br2 group with the hydrogen. This is done through a series of substitutions involving hydroxide at the boron atom that we don't really need to concern ourselves with. All we really need to say is that the replacement of Br2 with the hydrogen atom leads to the final alcohol, with the net result that the Br2 group in this intermediate that comes into oxidation has been replaced with oxygen. And this is most definitely an oxidation process since we've transformed a carbon that is partially negative in the starting alkyl borane into one that's partially positive due to its connection to an electronegative oxygen atom in the product alcohol. 